Physics Bites, a science podcast in English by the students of Notre-Dame. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Physics Bites, the English language physics podcast of the students of Notre-Dame de Sion. Here we have our senior students. We have three students who are going to talk to us about a new topic. Uh, I'm going to let them do their own introductions. Hello, everyone. My name is Theodora. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Roxanne. And I'm Alban. All three of you guys were last year in our uh, colonization of the moon project. You guys were working, if I remember correctly, on how to provide food and oxygen and water. I remember we learned a lot of stuff, and I remember you talked about fish eggs going into space, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that, that is the one thing that remains for me since last year. All right, but this year you're going to talk about a new topic. What are you guys talking about this year to us? So uh, you guys are going to go through a, maybe a bit of history of different theories of gravitation from the time of the ancient Greeks. And then uh, we're going to talk a bit more in detail about more modern theories of gravity, Newton, Einstein, and so forth. All right. So I will let you guys get started. Uh, we, we can remind what is gravity, even, well, everyone knows it, but it's... Uh, so gravity, we also call it gravitation, uh, it's a force that exists among all molecules, objects in the universe, and it, uh, it's a force that tends to attract uh, objects toward each other. And so anything that has mass has also gravity, uh, and objects with more mass have more gravity, uh, and uh, gravity also gets weaker with the distance. So the closer objects uh, are to each other, the stronger the gravitational uh, pull uh, pull them. So it's what we considered one of the fundamental forces of nature. We have four fundamental interactions, four fundamental forces. So it is one of the most fundamental phenomenon that we have tried to explain and we continue to try to work on it because we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, so when would you say we had our first theory of gravitation in, in, in human history? Uh, I would say in the last 300 years, because before uh, Greek philosophers just thought that uh, planets and stars were part of God's realm mm. and uh, followed a natural motion. And uh, just like Aristotle proposed that uh, objects fall towards the Earth because it's uh, their natural state. Right, so in a way it was some sort of a very primitive theories of gravitation, but we don't consider them theories in the modern sense because... Well, for theory to be modern, we have to be able to test it. And I guess New uh, Aristotle's theory of gravitation wasn't something that was tested. It was still a pretty interesting idea, right? Do you guys want to maybe give us a very brief history of what Aristotle's theory of gravitation was? How did he explain why things would fall and some things would float, for example? I think it was more of a philosophical theory yeah. than something right. really uh, mathematic. Certainly like he didn't explain something with uh, uh, formulas. Formulas. That's that's that is certainly the case because even until two or three centuries ago, we didn't call it physics. We used to call it natural philosophy. And what you're talking about is is this mathematical approach, this quantitative approach to physics that is very modern. And at that time, this was not how we did science. So it was sort of half philosophical, half just, okay, what are some ideas we can have about this? Okay, so putting aside the scientists and the philosophers of antiquity, when is the first modern theory of gravity that you guys came across? Uh, about the 17th century with Newton, that everyone knows because he had a an apple. Right. It's, it's a very romanticized legend of how he came across it. He probably did see an apple fall at some point and thought about it, but it didn't necessarily fall on his head. <laughs> but so we have to wait the 17th century, so we have a gap between... Uh, the, Almost 2,000 years. Yes, exactly. But I would just say that before Newton, there was also Kepler and Galileo, because uh, Kepler um, contributed to the gravitational research and um, what did he do? What, what is Kepler very well known for? Uh, he's known for uh, his uh, three different laws. Which concern what specifically? What are they trying to explain? What was he working on when he came up with the three laws? 
basin planets. Yes. And uh, motion stars. of what we call celestial mechanics, we call it orbital mechanics. Uh, what was he trying to do and what did he find? Uh, well, he uh, explained three laws. Uh, the first one that said that uh, all planets move around the sun in an elliptic uh, orbit. Right. Uh, Maybe a small uh, uh, recall of what an ellipse is. What do we mean by an elliptical, right? So it's like a, it's like an oval shape, uh, not quite a circle. A circle is an ellipse where the two foci are in the same spot. So, okay. And why, why are... Okay, so that's the first law. What is the second law? Uh, it says that uh, a planet sweeps uh, out equal areas in equal interval of time. Right. Which means what specifically about the way a planet is turning? It means that when it's uh, that like when Earth is closer to the sun, it's gonna go f uh, faster. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the further it goes away, when it's so the we call it about the 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 closest points is when it's going fastest, and when it's furthest from the sun is when it's going slowest. But These speeds are in a very specific way, in a way that the areas that are being swept out by uh, these planets compared to the location of the sun are equal, which is a very interesting law. And the third law? Uh, it said that, uh, says that the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of uh, the orbit's semi-major axis. Right. And so what is this actually sort of telling us about what we observe with the solar system. We did this in class this year, huh? <laughs> so, so let's make the diff let's be clear on the difference between the first two laws and the third laws. The first two laws are talking about one object uh, orbiting another object. Whereas the third law is talking about all the objects are that are in orbit around one object. So the first two laws would be telling us about the orbit of the Earth around the Sun or the Moon around the Earth. Uh, or Jupiter around the, the, the sun, whereas the third law is talking about all the objects that are turning around the sun. So all the planets, comets, etc. Right. So it, it's a more general law about how things orbit when they are sort of under the influence of one particular body. What is the link between this and gravitation? Because if I'm not mistaken, Kepler was be before Newton. So he didn't know of the laws of gravitation, right? So what is the link between Kepler and gravitation? Why you guys mentioned that uh, uh, there was gravitational research in a way, and then you mentioned Kepler. Uh, because I think it shows that uh, when the planet moves, well, they have an impact on each other uh, and, and their movement. So Yes, they are linked uh, together. So if something right. uh, moves, uh, it, uh, it shows that Uh, another object or another planet will move to, or not move, but be impacted by the uh, movement of the other. Right, and even Kepler himself in his journals at one point was writing something to the order of, well, if these planets are all moving around the sun in this sort of a clockwork way, there has to be something that's influencing, there has to be a way that the sun is influencing or communicating with these planets. So he sort of was foreseeing what we would call uh, gravitational force or gravitational fields or gravitational interactions. It's just that he didn't have an explanation for it yet. Yes, we, we can say that he had the int intuition of gravity, but right. he uh, couldn't explain it uh, with formulas as uh, Newton have, did. Uh, the other reason we have a lot of Uh, admiration for Kepler also is because he was sort of maybe one of the first scientists to treat something like this in a very mathematical way. He gave actual equations and so with him and Galileo being some of the contemporaries, they were the first to sort of start the mathematization of science and physics and then Newton took it to a whole new level. He kicked it up a notch. All right, so we talked about Kepler. Do you have something to talk about with, when it comes to Galileo before we go on to Newton? Uh, I think he mostly uh, realized that to move bodies are influenced by forces, and that force is necessary to change the motion. Right. But there's also something about the sun, no? Like Galilei, uh, I'm not sure, but just he... Uh, before we thought that the sun was orbiting around her, and then Galilei showed that... Right, so Galileo is tied to the whole Copernican revolution, in that he 
So I guess one of the things Galileo is most known for is for the idea of relativity of movement. So that if uh, I'm moving in the frame of reference of the car and the car is moving in the frame of reference of the ground, then I'm sort of moving in the frame of reference of the ground. So this whole idea of relativity of movement, uh, he was one of the ones who sort of really put it in very clear terms. Uh, but he's also very well known for another very famous legend of physics. Something about the Tower of Pisa, maybe? No? The Leaning Tower of Pisa? He was, he was from Pisa, he was a Tuscan. He went up there with two different weights, no? Alban? Yeah, objects with different mass uh, fall uh, as quickly. Uh, one is same, same speed. One at the same, same speed. right. So he was the guy who came up uh, with the most clear enunciation of this idea that objects fall independently of their mass at the same speed, right? And the, the legend that goes with Galileo is that he went up to the Tower of Pisa, he let go of two masses, one which was very heavy and was very, very light, and they both kind of fell at the same speed, same rate. But it was it's been tested and proved by many. As soon as we we even tested it on the moon, we took a hammer and a feather and one of the the, the there's a video of this, and they sort of let go of the hammer and the feather at the same time and it falls at the same speed. So, uh, so that also is linked to the idea of inertia, and to the idea of gravitation. But so it sort of prepared the ground for Newton and his famous law of universal law of gravitation. Do you guys want to maybe talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, so Newton discovered the relation between the motion of the moon and the motion of a body falling freely on Earth. He, uh, he assumed the existence of an attractive force between all massive objects, and uh, he concluded that the force existed by Earth on the moon is needed to keep it in a circular motion. So uh, he, he, um, he, and he realized that the moon would fly away from Earth, Um, in a straight line if uh, some force was not causing it to orbit around the Earth. Right. Without being in direct contact because the moon is many hundreds of thousand kilometers away from the Earth. So it's a, it's a, it's, it has to be something that works at long distances without any physical contact. And then you realize that this force could be the same as the force with which on Earth pulls object on its surface downward. And so Newton calls this force gravity and determined that gravitational force forces sorry, exist between all objects. And so, according to Newton's gravitational law, what is required to determine what the intensity of that force is? What are the parameters that have an influence on this? Gravitational constant, and then we need the masses of the bodies and the distance between the objects. Which we take to the square. Yes. yes, so he was able to show that uh, when the distance uh, is greater, yes, um, well, the, the, the gravitational, gravitational force will be uh, weaker. weaker. And not only it was weaker, but uh, you go twice as far away, the force is four times weaker. You go four times away, it's 16 times weaker. So it showed this sort of inverse proportional law to the square of the distance, which is something which we see often in physics in other contexts as well. All right, so this was a very successful theory. It really explained a lot of stuff. It was really powerful. Um, so now we're moving forward 400 years. Maybe before we move on to 400 years, uh, did anything happen in the meantime? W was Newton's theory able to explain everything? Maybe when objects were really massive? So I guess that, that could be part of it. I guess the question I'm asking you guys is, So you guys were going to talk about Einstein, right? So the question I had was, why did we need to go from Newton's theory to Einstein's theory? Why wasn't Newton's theory good enough? I mean, if a theory works, we don't need to have a new theory. If we come up with a new theory, it's because either the old theory was not giving answers to some questions, or it was giving wrong answers, or it was unable to explain some phenomenon. I think Alban's intuition wasn't incorrect. You're right. There were some, in some extreme cases, Newton's theory doesn't work. And this became more and more clear when we were able to make better observations, which had to take some time with our technology growing. So, to understand the complexities of, we have to move on Einstein, uh, because he explained a lot of things that we couldn't understand before. Uh, so, first we 
could talk about the equivalence principle. Right, this, this is a really good starting point because just to put this into historical context, uh, as uh, Louis and Esteban uh, talked about special relativity, what we call gravitation, Einstein's gravitational theory is called general relativity. And what it was, was a generalization of the principles of special relativity and this generalization, the key point was the equivalence principle. So I'll let you explain that a bit. So he was able to show that if we have two bodies in empty space, space sorry, and if they fall with the same uh, speed, no, they will fall uh, with the same speed and acceleration, even if they don't have the same mass. Right, which is what kind of Galileo was talking about with his famous experiment. Exactly. So this is the starting point. Uh, so do you do you remember there? There's a famous thought experiment that's associated to the with the lift. Yeah. Do you want to maybe give us a a short idea of what that is? Because it's a really interesting way of uh, getting a feel for the equivalence principle. Um. So I think the experience. I had a picture that I show in right. class, but he wanted to to uh, show the link uh, between uh, gravitation <coughs> a, uh, as a force, as a field, and right. acceleration. Right. Without gravitation. Yes, without, yes, I didn't uh, tell it, but... Um, so, and the idea is that if, if a person falls freely, uh, he will not feel his own uh, wave. Right, which is what happens to astronauts, for example, exactly. in the space station. So, so uh, we are used to say that astronauts are orbiting the Earth are weightless, uh, despite the fact that the Earth's gravity is still quite strong there. Otherwise, they would not be in orbit if there was no gravity, so they can't be weightless. Yes, yes so it's not possible. And I think it's one of the examples we could give uh, for right. your question about Newton right. uh, that right. he wasn't able to show, but I didn't thought about it. Um, in Einstein's uh, general theory, there is no difference between free fall and being uh, weightless. Right. So if we come back to the lift example, so the idea is that if you're stuck in a lift in the middle of space and you can't see what's going on outside, uh, and suddenly as you're floating around in the lift, you suddenly come down to the floor and you remain on the floor. And somebody asks you, okay, how do you explain this? There's two explanations. One of them is that the lift is not moving, but there's a gravitational field that suddenly appeared below me. The other explanation would be that, no, there's no gravitational field, but the lift started accelerating up. And that it is impossible for us to make the distinction between one or the other. There's no experiment that you can do inside the lift to say, oh, it's acceleration and not gravitation, or gravitation and not acceleration. Therefore, there is an equivalence between what we call an inertial frame of reference in a gravitational field and a non-inertial or accelerated frame of reference without a gravitation. That's that's the the idea behind the equivalence is between, like you said, gravitational fields and accelerations of frame of references. So, maybe we can go into a description of something that's uh, some of the key points in general relativity and how it's different from Newton's gravitation. Uh, so, uh, Einstein uh, wanted to show that uh, bodies with mass, so anything from an atom or a star, uh, will uh, distort uh, space and time. So, to be clear, this is completely new, right? Newton, nobody until Einstein had thought of space or time neither as being the same thing, neither as being something that can be sh changed and distorted, as you're saying. So this is very brand new. So you imagine that we are setting a large object in the center of a trampoline, yeah. and uh, the object would, yes, the object would press down into the f fabric, so it causing it to dimple. Yeah. And so it's the idea that you have to see a uh, space and time as dim dimension. As, as like an object with one, two, three, four n dimensions, and that like any object that has an extension and dimensions, it can be changed. The shape can change, and the way the shape changes, how does that happen for us? What, what does it mean that space is getting distorted? How do we, as human observers, would we observe this distortion of space? or space-time, rather. We have several experiences that... Uh, so, for example, we have two uh, 
two twins. Okay. Uh, one uh, go, uh, one uh, went on space, and okay. the other was on the earth. Yeah. And after like ten years, or it was a really I don't know, but it was a really long time. When he came back, uh, one was uh, older than the other, mm -hmm. so it clearly shows that there is something else. Uh, then our okay. masses. So this is also very much closely related to special relativity, right? This is one of those things that has to do with one person or one object being in movement compared to another one and how time and distances are dilated and changed with respect to that. Uh, it is necessary for Einstein's general relativity, but let's come back to the idea of curvature of space, right? Yeah, Alban? <gasps> So when there's uh, an object with uh, that's really massive, it causes uh, a greater distortion, and so it explains why smaller objects are attracted around the first one. So the example being like the trampoline that Theodora mentioned, uh, if we put like a big weight in the middle of the trampoline and then we throw little marbles, when they come to the part of the trampoline which is kind of dented, well, their trajectory is going to be modified. What we would see is not the, the denting of the space-time, what we would see is that, oh, this marble is coming and it's suddenly changing directions as if something was acting on it, as if there was a force there. And we can also see uh, that uh, light rays uh, are curved by yeah. this. So this is another one of those big differences between Newton and Einstein. In Newton's theory, gravitation has no effect on light. But in Einstein's theory, it yes. does. Yes, it has. And it also the experience of the lift. So he had an experience. Uh, you can take a lift like in your head. and A, a thought experiment. <laughs> exactly. And you imagine that the lift is going up. Uh, and you have like a little, uh, yes, flashlight. So it's going up and it's going up in an accelerated way, yes. not a constant speed, yes. right? Yes, an accelerated way. And uh, the light goes to the left and the light wants to go on the other wall. Yes, but because the lift is going up, uh, the light... Uh, will not go um, straight line, but will be curved uh, and go down. Right. So, as, as the lift is going up, because it's accelerating, the starting point for the light beam is higher than the point on the wall it's going to touch. So, to us, it looks like the light beam is curving, but you can also explain this with the equivalence principle, saying that it's just going in a straight line. It's, our point of view, our frame of reference, which is accelerating, which gives us the illusion that this is happening. Again, this famous equivalence principle, which is very important for uh, the gravitational theory of Einstein's. Uh, okay. There was a famous experiment also in 1918, I think, by a famous astronomer, astrophysicist, Arthur Eddington, with an eclipse that verified the curving of light? No? Do you guys remember that? It's okay. All right, we'll cut that out as well. <laughs> All right, so Einstein's theory was very, very successful. It explained a bunch of phenomenon that Newton's gravity could not explain. Uh, another famous one was the uh, movement of Mercury, which has a sort of recession, 43 degrees, I think, every century. Einstein's theory could explain that, but not the other one. There were other consequences, gravitational waves, which we finally discovered 100 years afterwards. Uh, what happened after Einstein? Was that the end of gravitational research? So we had a few problems uh, in extreme situations. Uh, so, for example, black holes. Uh, Einstein's theory didn't explain correctly what was going on at these scales. But so maybe we have to explain what is a black hole because be for really people it's like something with empty space, but it's because we've heard other people talk about black dark matter and dark energy, and now we're talking about black holes. It's like most of physics is very dark. So what is a black hole? How is that? Uh... It's like anything but empty space. It's like um... it's not a hole at all. Yeah. So it's a great amount of matter. Uh, 
packed uh, into a very very small area uh, so you can uh, think for example uh, of a star 10 times more massive than the sun uh, squeezed into a sphere uh, as uh, approximately the diameter of New York City. Or right, so like a few tens or hundreds of kilometers across containing all the mass of the sun. So very high densities. Yes, yes. and so the result is that the gravitational field is so strong that nothing uh, and not even light uh, can escape. Right. Now, the interesting point there is that we can actually come up with the same results with Newton's theory or with Kepler's theory. Uh, you guys had a test with that, no, not you guys, but the other class had a test with me on that question because we, we know that for something to get out of a gravitational field, it has to have a minimum speed. It's called the speed, uh, we call it uh, uh, escape velocity. So we can ask the question, okay, in what situation is the escape velocity higher than the speed of light? And we use Newton's theory and we use Kepler's theory, we can find out an answer. And it gives you the size, and the size is not the right size. It's two times bigger than what Einstein's theory would give, which corresponds to what we have observed. So again, another point of difference between these two theories. Uh, so black holes, are they just theoretical objects, or have we observed them? We uh, have observed yes. some. So how can we observe something that doesn't emit light? Uh, because it curves light, for example. Right, so we've observed it indirectly. Okay, so we have observed this indirectly. Uh, so another confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity. So it seems like it's a really successful theory. So why do we need to come up with other theories then? Because at the center of the black holes, it doesn't work. Because uh, the theory that we have for sub subatomic particles is pretty different uh, than the theory we have for um, other... For... Well, Planets and so. thank you for more. Uh, so you're saying that the laws of gravitation behave differently when we get closer to the scale, the quantum scale. And so we have uh, quantum mechanics that explains this really well. It doesn't explain uh, in the insides of black holes. Right. We we can't. We don't have a quantum mechanical description of the gravitational interaction. And understanding black holes is, is uh, really important because uh, we could learn something about the uh, evolution of galaxies, uh, so even about the beginning of the universe. Right. And in any case, if we have two major theories explaining most of the interactions, if they're not working together, then there's an issue going on. There's something that's missing. Okay. So maybe because we are slowly running out of time, uh, maybe we can move on to some post-Einsteinian theories. What are some of the more modern and uh, weird and you know very complicated theories of gravitation? Because you guys, I remember in your presentation, talked about at least two or three different ones. So since we, since the, the two theories we have are not compatible, we had to find one theory that could unify the other two. So we have, uh, for example, string theory. Uh, so it's a theoretical framework that says that the fundamental building blocks of the universe are not point-like particles, but tiny vibrating strings. Usually when we think about atoms or like electrons or quarks, we imagine them to be these zero-dimensional points that are not extended in space. Here we're making a fundamental difference that the smallest objects are actually strings. Are they in the same scale of, uh, as, as like, you know, uh, electrons and quarks? I would say they are really that they are smaller and much, they much smaller. oscillate at various frequencies so they produce different particles based on the so do they produce different particles or is it that different particles correspond to two different frequencies right what is the analogy that we always give to explain how different frequencies can be uh, new objects manifest at different it's, it's a musical analogy Ah, uh, well, when we have uh, a shorter string, uh, it oscillates quick, uh, more quickly. And to us, it appears as higher sound, right? So the idea being that with the same string, you can produce different musical notes. In this case, the different musical notes are an analogy for different particles that we observe at the atomic scale. But in the end, they're just 
the same string that's vibrating in different frequencies. So, so there's something very elegant and very nice in there because instead of having all these hundreds of different particles, now we just need one thing and that one thing can give an explanation for all these hundreds of things that are there. This is one of the reasons that people are so drawn to string theory, even though... Has it been confirmed? Have we proven string theory? No. Uh, so oh. there's a total lack of experimental verification uh, because, well, the energy scales required but we don't have them. Right, because the smaller we go, we need higher energies to explore that scale. And at the scale of string theory, which we call the Planck scale, the energies are just orders of magnitude higher than what we are able to produce and access. Uh, so does string theory give an explanation of gravity if it were true? Um, it does, but it's really mathematical. And so there's a multiplicity of solutions. Um, that causes some problems because we don't know uh, it's it's hard to determine which corresponds to what we can observe and in this theory there are multiple dimensions that we don't have right there's lots of problems with string theory in that what we call there is no string theory there are string theories there are almost an infinity of them and each one gives laws of physics that are slightly different and we have no way, or we haven't found any way over the past, past 40 years of saying, okay, this is the right s string theory. We have what we call the string landscape. And it's also created, it has created a kind of a civil war between physicists because there are many physicists who are like, okay, we're not doing physics anymore. If you can't do experiments to verify it, then it's not physics, it's just math. So there is a lot of conflict within the community of physicists today. Okay, maybe we can move on. So string theory, if it were true, would explain all the fundamental forces including gravitation so which is pretty good except that we don't have a string theory that's been verified what are some other explanations that you guys found in your research for uh, so there's another theory that's a uh, loop quantum gravity loop quantum gravity it's one of many theories it's i would say it's the second more acknowledged okay what um, is it talking about so it's saying that at the smallest scales, instead of take, uh, thinking of space and time as a smooth and continuous uh, space, uh, it suggests that we are the we are made. It's made of tiny discrete building blocks. Uh, it's like imagining space as if it were pex pixelated. Right. So we imagine space to be continuous, that every point is connected to every other point at even the smallest scale. You're saying that in this theory, space is sort of, it's limited uh, in terms of how small the building blocks of space-time would be. And they are like uh, little loops, um, and they are networks made of these loops. And they would represent in this theory the structure of space. Right, so here it's kind of more in the spirit of Einstein, I guess, in that we're trying to get a gravitational theory by talking about the structure of space and time. Okay, has this been verified? Uh, no, <laughs> none of these theories have been. So that's why we have several theories, but none of them are. Right, we have candidates, but we. Have, so, and the, is the same reason that we haven't verified loop quantum gravity that we haven't done string theory? Is it because the energies are too high? Uh, it's because uh, the scale is really, really small. So we cannot uh, observe this. So string theory, loop quantum gravity. Did you guys find any other weird ones? Well, there are a bunch of others, but I didn't get into them because there are just too many. Uh, maybe we can uh, start to finish up our little podcast here, our episode, because we've gone through a lot of stuff. Maybe I can ask you guys maybe a more personal question. How did you guys find this topic? What did you find interesting? Uh, what did you learn that you didn't know about before? Uh, or just any sort of thoughts that you personally might have. Well, let's start with, uh, with Theodora. Uh, I thought it was really complicated to understand because even in French, uh, there is kind of uh, things that I can't understand. So in English, it was uh, uh, really hard, but it was a challenge that I enjoyed. The problem, you're right, because uh, we do a lot of gravitation in high school but it's Newtonian gravitation and it's much, much easier. For anything higher than that, you need much more mathematics. Newton is still great, but when it comes to Einstein, <laughs> it becomes uh, uh, harder. Uh, I really liked um, the part of, well, Alban's part. 
Oh, the more wacky modern <laughs> theories? Yeah, everybody likes that. I, I've i already heard about it, but never really interested, so I <laughs> didn't really like my part oh, 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 oh. <laughs> about Einstein, because uh, there is so many different aspects to, to go on, and uh, it's really... Uh, mathematic things that I <laughs> I can't understand. You didn't like the fact that you couldn't really sort of understand. You yes, just have to read what other people were saying about it. Yes, you can just read and not really understand the. Well, maybe that will motivate you in a couple of years to start uh, tackling it yourself. Uh, Roxanne, did you? Uh, what did you think about the topic? Uh, I think it was a great topic, but a bit hard at our yeah. level. But I think it was really interesting learning about different theories and uh, even <coughs> if I heard about some of them, I just didn't really know what it was. So you found that it was uh, difficult, but you liked the idea of having maybe a slightly better understanding of things that you'd heard about, but you didn't know what it means. Alban, you had the... Well, I liked a lot this topic. Uh, I think it was nice to go further than Newton because we, well, we know Newton and Kepler, but... Aside from that, not much. There's still a lot in there. So we can do a lot of really interesting stuff with it, but you get a glimpse of what the fun stuff is that would come later on. And I thought it was interesting to hear about Einstein's theory of general relativity. I knew about it, about the curving of space and time, but I didn't know much. And I also like the theories. Uh, I found it interesting to know that there are two t different theories that we cannot put as one. Uh, and it was fun to look into the few of our well, string theory and quantum theory. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a fun topic. It is kind of advanced for us, but I think that should not be a, uh, a barrier to try and understand. And I think you guys did a really, really good job of it. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the topic. And uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So that is Physics Bites for this week. We hope that you enjoyed the episode. Tell us what you thought about the topic in the comments section. If you did enjoy the show, then subscribe to our podcast, tell all your friends about it, and leave us five stars. Most importantly, come back soon for a brand new episode. Hey!